Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Spartan. And I'm Fudgy. And we are back. Today we're reacting to the histories and lore of Game of Thrones for season two. Season one did really well. You guys really liked that video and we thought it added a little bit of extra flavor to the show. We got to hear different perspectives from different people. It was a bit intriguing and almost like a summary slash transition from past season to the next season. So yeah. we sort of don't mind doing these, you know, from season to season. We do have moderators checking out for spoilers, so no one needs to stress. These have been checked. They are cleared. In future ones that do have spoilers, we'll know about them and we'll manage that. So no problems. One thing that I liked about the last Histories and Law video that we did was that we got to hear from people's perspective, like a lot of different people on the same event. And that was quite intriguing because we're very much people who likes to see things from lots of different angles rather than just one very biased opinion on an event. And I think it also highlights some degree, you know, the, the old quote that history is often told by the victors. But contrary to that, sometimes, you know, the losers are also very bitter and can see things one way. So we just saw, you know, even differences between how the Targaryens and yeah. the Baratheons viewed the taking over of King's Landing, the usurping of the previous king and, and all that kind of stuff. And that was pretty interesting. So I honestly don't, actually know at all what this season two is going to touch on like it's touching on the events of season two honestly i've got no idea what it said or what to expect from this yeah same. other than the fact that it's going to be similar tone to the first one we've heard that the visuals got a little bit of an upgrade so that could be nice to look at and the way we usually do this is we watch each segment i'm assuming this is segmented like the other one if we've got thoughts discussed in each segment they will be done in between you know while we're obviously reacting to what we're watching and then, as always, there'll usually be a discussion at the end if there's anything else we've got left to talk about. Yep. And because my memory isn't great, I've got my trusty notebook. Yeah. And disclaimer. Your memory is better than mine. My memory is good. But my attention span, an hour and six minutes yeah. of pure storytelling without, you know, as much visual aid as is in the normal episodes is a lot of focus. And usually there's a really law heavy, right? So I'm telling you right now, I'm going to miss a lot of things. Yeah, we both are. Yeah, I'm just going to do my best to absorb as much as I can, but feel free in the comments to fill in the gaps as well because there's going to be a lot of big lore dump, I'm imagining. I think we're more comfortable as well with a lot of the characters this time around as well. Last time we got a few characters mixed up. Yeah, like we get Maester Lewin and um, Eamon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we just saw two old people were like, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> As always, guys, a big thank you to everyone who's supporting us over on Patreon. It really does help the channel out a lot and does let us do what we do. If you are interested in supporting us over on Patreon, check out the link in the description. We do have ad-free early access to upcoming reactions as well as uncut reactions. So if any of that interests you, check that out. And for those of you over on YouTube, if you enjoyed today's reaction, if you enjoy this kind of content, let us know in the comments. Hit that like button. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button so you're up to date for as soon as we drop Season 3, Episode 1, which will be coming after this. And I'm really hyped for that as well. So this one's Robert's Rebellion by Stannis Baratheon. So I wonder if they're still talking about the original Rebellion, but from oh, Stannis' true. point of view. Which I we, think so. They might be, yeah. Because we sort of sympathized a bit with Stannis. People mentioned in the comments, though, that it was very normal. In fact, the next in line is meant to stay at... And hold their land, Storm's called? End. So... It wasn't as much a robbery that Renly got certain lands and Stannis got his, but I still did feel his pain and like he didn't yeah. just get the acknowledgement or the involvement in the, you know, in the critical war. Like he was saying, no one would remember his name. So it would be interesting to hear his take on what happened from his point of view while, you know, Ned and, and Robert were on the front yeah. lines. And let's be fair, it's very simple for a king to just say, you know, just acknowledge the efforts and then everyone will know. Like, so I think just that purposeful leaving out is what Stannis is really upset about. My brother Robert Baratheon had raised the banners of Storm's End, our ancestral castle, against the, way, the mad talks. King Aerys. John Arryn of the Vale and Eddard Stark of the North stood with him, and Hoster Tully of the Riverlands would join. But their lands were far lines. from ours, and separated by the combined strength of the West, the Reach, and King's Landing itself. Even Robert's own lords were against him. It's it was very the matter hardest of fact. choice I've ever made. My brother or my king. Blood or honor. Mm. Ares true. ruled by right true. of all the laws in Westeros. Everyone knew the price of defiance. 
but there are deeper, older laws. The younger brother bows before the elder. I followed Robert. Interesting. Strange seeing him the war, submissive. Miss Tyrell's indecisive victory at Ashford cut Robert off from Storm's End. Instead of pursuing Robert and risking his record, Mace Tyrell turned east and laid siege to our home. His vast army and navy encircled us and prevented any resupply by land or sea. Mm. If a wagon yeah. tried to reach us, it was burnt. If a ship tried to land, it was sunk. Shit. We were locked in Storm's End to starve. But Robert That's the conversation me him and Davos were castle, having. No matter the cost. He could ill afford to lose his ancient seat, which had never fallen. While Robert smashed Rhaegar on the trident, my men ate the dogs. Because the horses had already been devoured. Yeah, we heard about that as well. While the Lannisters sacked King's Landing, we ate the rats. If the smuggler Yuck. Davos had not slipped through the Tyrell blockade with his onions, we'd have eaten our own dead. Good but men, I Davos. Held the castle until Lord Eddard remembered us and marched to lift the siege. The Tyrells didn't even put up a fight. And Robert threw um. a feast to celebrate Lord Eddard's victory. <laughs> of course he did. I was sent to the royal island stronghold of Dragonstone to deal with Viserys and Daenerys, the last surviving oh. Targaryen So they were living there. Before I yeah, arrived, I knew that. however, they escaped across the narrow sea. Mm. Robert was furious. I just didn't know he Stannis went there. He stripped me of there. Storm's End and gave it to that prancing fool, Renly. Oh, is that why? Brother. Is that I why he gave her? Dragonstone. Well, that's his perception of why it happened. Now Robert is dead, and a bastard pretender soils my throne while the realm fills with schemers and traitors. <laughs> bastard pretender, I love that. But the rightful king is coming for them all. That's why I, I love Stannis. I will not stop until I have scoured this land clean of abomination. Damn. The Baratheons say, ours is the fury. Yep, I will fair. show them. Line. Fury burns. Oof. Yeah, so that's interesting. I guess, like you said, it is his perspective. But I didn't know he was sent to Dragonstone to for that reason. For Targaryen children. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah. Know, I didn't think he mentioned that at all. Well, I knew he was there during season one of Game of Thrones. I just thought, like, you know, he's just living there, which I guess he is. But yeah, that makes more sense as to how he got there. So we're getting two sides of the story because on yeah. the one hand, we get told that the brother, the next in line. It's his job to be at Dragonstone, mm -hmm. but then how come he's? But he's saying that he Dragonstone was stripped from him. So no, he was saying Storm's End was stripped. Storm's from End him. was stripped. Sorry, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So he saw which was that, their homeland. Yeah. So he saw it as a punishment. I don't even know if we'll get the truth in this scenario. It's just different. Yeah, perspective. Percept yeah. Well, next we've got Davos, which will be interesting because Davos. We've only heard bits and pieces about him, so it'll yeah. be different to see. Because I always wondered how he, why, and how he came to save. Stannis, but why, you know? So that'll be interesting to see how he can, how he fits into the whole story. Yeah. We don't even know if he's alive at this stage. We just saw the wildfire blow him up, but we don't actually know. Is he confirmed dead? Is he alive? I think he's alive. Like, I just have this feeling because Stannis didn't mention anything about him, you know? the same like, feeling you have with Ned? No, Ned was a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is Robert's Rebellion from Davos Seaworth's perspective. In King's Landing, if you leave the Red Keep and aren't careful, you may find yourself in Flea Bottom. Mm, in such a cesspool the poor area. that House Seaworth have its glorious start. I got out as soon as I could, finding work on a smuggler's ship. Soon, every port on the narrow sea had a bounty on me which they would collect if I didn't pay a percentage to the right people or pick oh, wow. the right tides. You know how to tell a good smuggler. When you talk to one, there's a head that talks back. I was very good. Davos of Flea Bottom had run with orphans and beggars, but Davos the smuggler was received by merchants and lords when nobody would catch them. Oddly, the only honest work came from pirates like the notorious bloodthirsty salad or sand we saw he An knew one of them all he ever wanted was someone to buy his cargo quickly before the tide left and sell it without telling where i got it 
In time, mm. I saved enough to buy a small plot of land and found a woman who was kind enough to overlook my trade. She gave me a son, Mathos. So he's worked oh, hard. Right, yeah. Dreamt of the trader's circle around the Jade Sea, just one trip and I could settle us and our family for life. Then some storm lord revolted against the Iron Throne. Yep. Wars are not as good for smugglers as you'd think. Every harbour fills with guards and inspectors, and the seas filled with blockades and pirates paid by each side to prey on the other. Would Though make I work much harder. Mad King, I'd grown up around the power of King's Landing. I figure this Robert Baratheon would end the same as the other rebel lords, burnt to ash. But he didn't. This man's the different. North, the Riverlands and the Vale joined him. And then the taverns people drank to Robert's health openly. Brave fools, I thought. But I had a family <laughs> who'd be left in the cold if I lost my head. When Mace Tyrell marched on Robert's home of Storm's End, I spied the end of the rebellion. The castle was garrisoned by Robert's younger brother Stannis and a small guard, and would not hold out for long. When it fell, Robert would be homeless, and his support would bleed away. This I knew from experience. What he Months thought. later, Stannis was still holding the castle. Nobody cared. But on voyages, Months. I had seen what famine does, and I thought of all those men in Storm's End who would die unmourned and forgotten. Wow, so he no thought about everyone else. It's interesting. I told my wife and myself that I'd get a high price for the onions and salt beef. In truth, I knew I'd be captured by the Tyrell galleys or drowned. Then I was too stubborn. Later that night, in the dark, in a tiny boat with a black sail, wow. I cursed myself and the moonlight as I waited for the tide to turn. Damn devil! The wind beat the sail so hard I ripped it down, fearing the Tyrell ships would hear. Luckily, they had grown lax. With muffled oars alone, I steered my cargo through the treacherous currents and snarls of rock that give Shipbreaker Bay its name. The waves finally carried me, soaked and near blind from sea water, through the mouth of the yeah. cavern beneath the castle. Then, Stannis Baratheon arrived. Stannis the Manus. The had left him gaunt, but not weak, never weak. Never he weak, okay, me and accepted my onions with cool courtesy, betraying no emotion, even as all wept. He doled out the food to his wife, and each of his men before he ate himself, a portion no oh, larger wow. than yeah. any other. I'll, that's what I love about him. He always when he leads by example. Me, I could see his mind had already returned to the castle's defense. His duty. After Ares fell duty. and Lord Stark lifted the siege, Stannis summoned me. For my salvation at Storm's End, I was to be granted a knighthood, a keep of my own, and my son taken into Stannis' personal service. Davos of Flea Bottom had become Sir Davos of House Seaworth and his son would serve Man. the king's own brother. One but noble act. For my and my previous onion. crimes as a smuggler, I was to have the fingertips of one hand taken off above the highest joint. Stannis held that I had flouted the laws of the land for years and a good act does not wash out the bad. That's you funny, dude. Yeah, I On five, Stannis gave my son a future and my family a name that I could never have imagined, nor earned. No wonder he's own. so grateful. I still keep the finger bones in a bag around my neck to remind me what I was and what I owed to Stannis. For I still admire him as a smuggler. I visited many ports, taverns, and back alleys, and saw many things in this world, but never justice. Until mm. Stannis. Until Stannis. Very interesting guy Stannis is. Yeah. As you said, he's a very matter-of-fact person, but he also, so far, he seems like, at least with a lot of his decision making, he's probably as close to unbiased as you're going to get from most characters. Like, even a guy yeah. who rescued his life, rather than just being like, oh my god, I owe you everything, it's like, you did an amazing act here and I'm going to reward you for it, yeah. but you've also done past crimes and I need to be fair on both ends, I can't overlook that. It's like, but he also leads by example, I think in most cases, he has contradicted himself, which we know. But, you know, we saw him in their battle in Blackwater in season two, where he's one of the first ones fighting. Yeah. Even in that situation. And up that ladder. Correct. And his boat was right near that wildfire. It was just fortunate that he didn't get hit. Yeah. 
And then even now we see him feeding his men before he even feeds himself, despite being on the brink of starvation. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a very strong, you know, state of mind. Yeah, a hundred percent. A lot of people wouldn't. Uh, Joffrey definitely oh. wouldn't. Oh. Yeah. But it's interesting, like, Davos's perspective, even in that moment where you'd be like, oh my God, yes, food. He goes, he had no emotion. But I didn't know it was his fingertips. I thought it was his knuckles. No, that- no, no, I never, oh. The, I, I always yeah. fingertips I knew okay. but he said bones so I didn't realise it was that deep I thought it was like maybe yeah, a little no. bit of skin it's oh. like really deep where he got the bones too they never really show it on the show do they they never show no. his hand no yeah. Davos had a really tough life I mean he was essentially raised in Flea Bottom which is like a very poor area and we've seen how people in Flea Bottom get overlooked a lot especially in House of the Dragon yeah big time it's interesting though how he, j- he didn't even think that, that necessarily that the Baratheons would win the war, yeah. but then just had a moment of consideration for Stannis and the people at Storm's End, and then just yeah, not even knowing the people, just went to go deliver them food on, on a on a almost almost a suicide mission, like literally, yeah, yeah. He he said that he would have gotten caught. Yeah, he was prepared to it's get interesting. caught, and he lied to his wife saying, you know, I'm going to get lots of money, and I don't think there was any wealth in that for him in that trip yeah like i mean stunned. other than stannis you know gifting him a higher status yeah maybe because he'd been around poverty so much he'd seen people starve yeah that yeah. was like his soft spot well that's so. what he was saying like it reminded him of the orphans in flea bottom okay so robert's re- rebellion from marjorie tyrell's perspective interesting some great houses call us upstarts But the truth is that while the Starks and Lannisters fell to the Targaryens in defeat, House Tyrell rose. For thousands of years, our family served as loyal stewards to the Kings of the Reach, until the last of their line unwisely burned to death, resisting the Targaryen invaders. To save the Reach from a similar fate, we yielded the castle of Highgarden to Aegon and his sisters. In gratitude, the Targaryens gave House Tyrell dominion over the Reach. And we became lords of the castle in which, for generations, we had served. Under the Targaryen dynasty, Westeros prospered. Gone were the petty wars of seven kingdoms and the endless thirst for minor glories that drove them. The Westerlands enriched the realm. The North guarded it. And the Reach and Riverlands fed it. This she kind of likes this what period. Robert Baratheon shattered with his rebellion against Ares Targaryen. Mm. When the call to arms came, though, we did not want to answer. The Reach is a gentle land, and honestly, the Mad King was not much loved. But we owed peace and status to his family. My father, Mace Tyrell, called his banners and marched north to battle the rogue Stormlord Robert. Who had already defeated against three them. forces in a single day. And at Ashford, my father won. Some oh. chastened my father for not pursuing Robert after the battle. We had cut him off from the Stormlands, the seat of his power, and he had fled north, within easy grasp of Lord Tywin Lannister, the Hand of Ares, for twenty years. My father moved instead to lay siege to Robert's ancestral stronghold of Storm's End. Storm's End, The rose right. would strangle the right. stag so, as yeah. the lion okay. pounced. So it was her so father that went to that, the family of Tyrells. But the lion slumbered and Robert slipped past the king's forces to join Ned Stark. We could have lifted the siege and deployed our armies north to aid the crown. We what? could have stormed the walls of the castle and made Robert homeless. But we had ample supplies, control of land and sea, and most of all, patience. Yeah, so they didn't have to. Our siege would succeed, eventually, at little cost of life to us. Poor Stannis, dude. If Robert prolonged the war with minor victories, our capture of Storm's End would hasten his downfall. And if Robert won the war, well... It would not do for him to find us in his halls with the bodies of his brother Stannis and his sworn men. When the lion finally showed his colours and purged King's Landing, we knew our cause was lost. 
Okay, so that's My sort of play to save. My the peaceful route and bent the knee to Robert, who heartily pardoned us. Oh. Strange, considering how we'd beaten him and starved his brother to the brink of death. Yeah, true. We were to keep our lands, castle, and title. So he was but a forgiving king, more than people give him credit for. Court. It didn't matter. The Reach was still the most fertile of the Seven Kingdoms, and under our hand. Every flower, even the rose, needs pruning. Then it grows strong. Mm, and she's sort of saying like she's the rose. I think so, yeah. That was interesting. Like you said Rob was, or Robert, was a forgiving king, but... I don't know, was that just because there was a bit of friction between him and Stannis and that's why he was like, oh, don't worry about it, rather than forgiving to the Tyrells? Do you know what I mean? I think he's generally can be smart and he knows he needs more allies than enemies. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I guess my perception of forgiving also comes from Joffrey being the worst example. <laughs> like Joffrey, But Joffrey literally just wouldn't excuse anything. So yeah. a real warrior like Robert, it's interesting seeing that even though somebody had defeated him yeah. at a certain point of battle... He was still willing to pardon it once his outcome was resolved. Which yeah, with strong warrior archetypes, you don't always know which way they're going to swing. So, but that's that's why I'm like asking whether it's not so much just the forgiveness for the Tyrells, rather than like a stick it to yard to Stannis. Not sure. Yeah, which it's actually interesting hearing her perspective with all of this that the Baratheons and the Tyrells were kind of at odds because then her and her brother literally married and essentially dated Renly Baratheon. Yeah, I know. I think she saw Renly as, you know, exempt from, he wasn't really involved in any of it as far as we know. Maybe. And we do know that she is looking for opportunities, even in the way that she's speaking. Like, it's like she's looking for opportunities to rise again. And she really does see herself as worthy. Yeah. I found it interesting that I don't remember all of it, but essentially the Tyrells and Tullys feed the land and the North guard it. I can't remember what the Westlands were, but yeah, it's like each had their role. And then if any of that was in friction, war, all out war. Yep. Okay. So this one's, I think the whole thing might be Robert's Rebellion just from different people's perspectives, but this one's Catelyn Stark. So this one will be interesting, I think, because I'm not really liking Catelyn at the moment. Family, duty, honor. Every Tully child learns our words, but I was a woman before I understood them. Years before, my father had taken to foster the son of a wartime friend, a minor lord on the fingers. The boy had arrived oh, at our country as yeah. Peter Baelish. Due to his <laughs> home and size, my brother soon named him Littlefinger. When so I came brother's of age, one named him. Brandon Stark of Winterfell sought and won my hand. To my father, Brandon was heir to the North and a suitable match for a daughter so of the North. Brother. To me, Brandon was wild and terrifying, never far <laughs> from laughter or trouble. I loved him with all the fire of a first passion, much Damn. I came to realize as Peter loved me. When Peter right. heard of my engagement, he challenged Brandon to a duel. Peter survived only because I begged Brandon not to kill him. I yeah, still we heard about Peter's that. Family. Now he ain't family, love. I wish I had let him die. Damn. Only days before my wedding, when I thought to be happy forever, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen abducted Brandon's sister, Lyanna. Hot-blooded as always, Brandon immediately rode for King's Landing to demand justice which the Mad King Ares Targaryen gave him. And this is all the downfall now. Twisted fashion. The day the Raven arrived with the news of my Brandon's death, I locked myself in a room and refused to eat for days. Mm. Until my father reminded me of my duty. I was to marry so Eddard, duty Brandon's younger brother. Is a big thing. A man whom I had never met, though of whom none spoke ill or spoke anything at all. Oh. oh, our oh. union would cement an alliance of the North, Vale, Stormlands, and Riverlands in rebellion against the Mad King. I was a Tully. I did my duty. We were married quickly, 
and was spared only one night before he had to return to the field. Oh, I spent wow. the night by the windows waiting for a raven to hear if my son would grow up fatherless or at all. We knew the price of defeat. She had a pretty rough. scoured the kitchens and washing rooms for any and all gossip. Robert had won and crushed the Mad King. Robert had lost, but Jamie Lannister was now king. Robert had almost won, but the Mad King had it's become a dragon and burned King's Landing to ash. At night, I told myself the war would end soon and bring peace. Either a victory or the grave. I was wrong. Robert won, and my husband avenged his brother and my love. But when he came home to me, he could not meet my eyes. Damn. Because he has John's the yeah. by his side. You still don't know who the mother is. Bastards, I know. And under the strain of war, any man, no matter how honorable, may forsake his vows for a night of warmth that he may never know again. Yeah, the sure. Robert Stark was not built like other men. His northern honor would not let him sequester his shame in some distant holdfast. He brought this boy, this Jon Snow, home to raise with his true-born children. Respect for Ned, he's a good father. My yeah. Children. I just don't like the way she just said that, though. Are sweet now. They are all I have left of my Ned. Our family is broken and scattered. And our son must wage a war for the pieces. Then you're not home. helping with. The Starks are of the north and, like the snows of winter when they come south, they melt away. Wow, so she married Ned out of duty. So we, we, we knew that. Yeah. A little bit, but this was more context behind it. Yeah, but now we like really see her perspective as well when she's talking to Rob about Talissa. Yeah. But I didn't know that they quickly got married, he went off, and then came back with the child. Like, that is so soon. Yeah, and, and before that, she got married and he went off and died. Well, I don't think they were married. They were betrothed, I think. Okay. Either way, just she had a rough time with love. Yeah, yeah. And yeah... Uh, I understand initially, but I agree. I overall, despite the times and just personally, the show of uh, the way she dealt with Jon Snow, I yeah. feel like was rough. Like I get it. She was feeling like she would have preferred, she didn't mind that Ned had cheated on her, but she would just didn't want to know anything about it. True. But I, you know, yeah, Ned, I respect Ned for being an honorable father. And, despite, and not just like throwing him to the side. Yeah. And despite being, feeling ashamed of what he did, having, you know, raising his son, make sure he had a good life. Yeah. And it will be very interesting, I think, when we find out who John's mother is. I assume that's going to be a later point in the story. That's been something that I've been quite interested to find out. Yes, I've heard you every episode. <laughs> okay, so this one is not Robert Baratheon's rebellion. It's I didn't think it would be all focused on one. I thought usually there's at least three or so yeah. segments, but they it grows. So yeah, the Greyjoy Rebellion by Rob, Rob Star. She would have been relatively young. At the time. So this will be interesting, I think. Yeah, young, but, like, I think old enough to, like, remember it yeah. fairly well. Yeah, 100%. Because if Jon Snow was just a baby when he was brought back, then Rob must have been, like, like Bran's age maximum. Because they're all similar age, you know? Yeah. So apparently Rob Sark is probably, like, 16 at the moment. In the show. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was the age that I... Wow, that's weird. I know. I, I'm glad they cast older actors because yeah. I can feel it more properly when I see him yeah. at the age he is. I know. Dark wings, dark words. I was only a boy when the Raven came to call my father, Lord Eddard Stark, to another war. Balon Greyjoy had raised the Iron Islands in revolt and burned the Lannister fleet at anchor. King Robert Baratheon again needed his old friend. My mother, Catelyn, was not happy to lose Buckle her old husband to Robert again. Six years before, he had left her to avenge his father and brother against the Mad King. But now he had sons and daughters of his own. And, unspoken, another son and who was King's Landing was a third time, time as well. To war. My brother, Jon Snow. But she knew that in marrying my father, she had married the North. We hold our honor and duty as dear as our old gods. 
Yeah. When the time came, my father marched south to restore peace and order to okay, the realm. Interesting. My so father always told then. me the Iron Islands were a strange and dangerous place. Its people, the Ironborn, keep neither the old gods nor the seven, and despise all honest toil. Their ancestors yeah, ravaged yeah. the western shores, raping and slaving and putting it to the torch, and their songs still ring through the halls of the Ironborn, while everywhere else they are whispered to wayward children at bedtime. Oh my Perhaps God. Lord Balon thought Westeros had not healed from the war against the Mad King and was as fragmented and suspicious as the ancient kingdoms his forebears had terrorized. Robert's navy corrected him at Fair Isle when they smashed the Proud Iron Fleet. Robert Shit. and my father corrected him at Pike, his own castle, when they pulled down his towers and breached his walls. Damn. My father never liked to speak of his battles. But from other men, I learned what transpired. Thoros of Mir was first through the breach with his flaming sword. Not far behind him was Jorah Mormont of Bear Island. My oh. father's bannerman who earned the knighthood he would later shame, and lords from every corner of the Seven Kingdoms. All day, through every passage in the castle, they fought side by side. My father with our ancestral sword Ice, and King Robert with his war hammer against a horde of axe-wielding ironborn. In I'd have been a cool duo to say. Lord Balon bent the knee. King Robert generously yeah. allowed Lord Balon to retain his title and castle. The price of peace was custom. The only son of Balon's to survive his foolish rebellion would be taken as a hostage against future treasons. Balon. My father even volunteered to foster the boy himself. I yeah. suspect. To make Theon Greyjoy a different man than his father. Who would bring Ooh, honor true. and duty to the Iron nice. Islands when he returned as heir. How did that go? So my mother's silent fear came true. And my father returned with another child. Oh, true. Theon ate with us, played with us, and fought with us. Once the great bond between my father and Robert Baratheon united the realm against the Mad King and brought him to justice for his crimes. Now, another monster sits on the Iron Throne, and another debt of blood is owed my family. Theon is my murdered father's ward. I am my murdered father's son. Like my father and Robert, bound Damn. in blood, if they not by blood, that. we are yeah. brothers. I really like that he feels that, you know, we wow. are brothers. Yeah, but that's why I felt so betrayed when yeah. Theon did what he did. That was interesting. I know that Balon bent the knee, obviously, but then when Theon comes back to the Iron Islands and he's judging Theon for that, like, all this was your doing. I'm just like, oh, leave the kid alone. Like, look yeah. what you've turned him into. Ned did such a good job. And because of your lack of love or lack of understanding and complete contradictions, you've turned Theon into... Yeah, and to be fair, he's probably... Theon probably represents his greatest failure. So, yeah. you know, it's just he's hating himself and Theon ends yeah. up being the representation of that. Yeah, for sure. In the harsh times, it's just the way it was going to be. But yeah, so Ned didn't like talking about his battles. Which makes sense. Because yeah. even though the Hound believes that every man loves killing, and I believe there's a certain vigor to battle and, and conquest that Ned enjoyed, but... It was more about duty for him. Yeah, we did say that he liked... He was more of a defender of the weak kind of guy. Yeah. He didn't seem like he enjoyed, you know, just killing. He didn't yeah. enjoy it. He didn't enjoy tyranny. He was quite fair. He wanted to give people, you know, even, you know, Cersei wanted to give her an out peacefully, yeah. even though he thought that she probably murdered his good friend, the hand, like very forgiving, you know, kind John of guy. Aaron, which, yeah. Yeah. Which very, you know, very forgiving person and even taking, you know, Theon under his wing to try and help raise him to be a better man rather than just out of victory or spite to kill him. Yeah. Shows what kind of man that is. Okay, so let's hear this perspective from young Theon. Or older Theon talking about his view from being young. Yeah. When Aegon and his dragons burned Harren the Black and all his sons at Harren Hall, the days when men feared the sight of our long ships were over. Aegon would not permit marauders and raiders in his seven kingdoms. With Harren died our empire and the old way that forged it. But what is dead Damn. may never die. Six what years dead, after Robert never Baratheon die. won his crown, my father, Balon Greyjoy, sought to restore our ancient rights. 
he declared the Iron Islands independent and himself its king, and sent the Iron Fleet in a daring raid on Lannisport where they burned the Lannister ships at anchor, making us unchallenged in the Sunset Sea. This was the seed of our undoing. My eldest brother Roderick sure. led a frontal assault on Seaguard, a town built to protect the mainland from us. After ferocious fighting beneath the city walls, he was slain by Lord Jason Malister and his men defeated. By this time, Stannis Baratheon had brought Robert's fleet around Westeros and somehow managed to trap the Iron Fleet at Fair Isle, smashing it. Stannis Robert's was involved in this bit more. All but assured, yet we made him bleed for each island. Stannis Baratheon captured Greatwick, the largest of the Iron Islands, and Sir Barristan Selmy himself subdued Old Wick. Damn, Robert and Lord and Dad Stark led the main assault against Couple the Iron warriors there. Pike. They raised the town of Lordsport to the ground before Robert turned his full fury on our family's stronghold. When they breached the walls, the first through was Thoros of Mir with his ridiculous flaming sword, followed by every minor lord of Westeros hungry for glory. Yeah, true. My other brother Maron was killed when the siege engines brought down a tower on his head. Shit. I was now my father's only living son. That's brutal. The heir to the Iron Islands. When my father saw his cause was lost, he wisely conceded defeat to Robert, who otherwise would have pulled down our castle stone by stone with us in it. As my father said to me then, so he had no, no choice. man has ever died from bending his knee. He who kneels may rise again, blade in hand. Interesting. He will not that was always his plan. Dead. Stiff legs and all. As it stands, Robert allowed my father to keep his lands and title as Lord of the Iron Islands, King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, Lord Reaper of Pike. It's a little pretty, well, fair. pretty fair. His last son and heir shipped off to Winterfell as an honoured guest. I would eat at the Stark's table and play with the Stark children. I think that's a pretty good if deal. my father rebelled again, Lord Eddard Stark would take his sword and cut off my head. Okay, so there's always that fear. Okay. Duty. I get that. Interesting. I wonder if Ned could have actually done it. Yeah, I just have this feeling that he would, because he raised him. After so many years, I feel yeah. like he wouldn't have been able to. Yeah. But I get that as a child, you have this fear of, okay, does dad love me enough? Will he rebel? Does he care about my life? Yeah, okay. 100%. I get it. Yeah, a little bit more insight into Theon. I do get it. Yeah, like the it's fear hard. he must live with. Yeah. Yeah. All right, big boy Stannis on the Greyjoy Rebellion. Oh, I love I love hearing <laughs> his perspective because he's just so direct to the point, cutthroat. Just says it how it is. Yeah. Though Robert had risked all our lives to win it, the Iron Throne <laughs> bored him. He cared the little he for said justice it. and less for rule. If it weren't women or wine skin, he had no use for it. Without the stalwart John Arryn as Hand of the King, the challenge to Robert's crown would have come much earlier than it did. The Iron Islands have never lacked for treachery. They respect only strength, and honour is as foreign to them as the Seven. After six she, years, she's very ruler, presenters. Lord Balon Greyjoy wagered that King Robert had not won the support of the great houses of Westeros many of whom still named him Usurper. Lord Balon declared the Iron Islands independent and sent his Iron Fleet to Lannisport. Lord Tywin Lannister was careless and the Ironborn caught and burnt his ships at anchor. Lord Balon and his reavers controlled the Sunset Interesting. Sea. Interesting about Tywin. Robert then ordered me to succeed where his father-in-law, Lord Tywin, had failed. It's a big, Beneath it's a big Robert's moment. fury, I sensed relief. War he could understand. He would smash Lord Balon as he had Rhaegar. I raised Robert's fleet and sailed around Westeros to the Iron Islands. I set a trap for the Iron Fleet off Fair Isle. As sailors and warriors, the Ironborn are unparalleled. But they're not soldiers. They have no yeah. discipline, no strategy. No unity. Yeah, in a battle, a big each distinction. man fights. We've only seen for that. No glory. unity. Yeah. And their longships are built for lightning strikes and shore raids. More like thugs. When the captains rushed in, I smashed their longships with our larger war galleys. The strength of the Ironborn is in their ships. 
With the Iron Fleet broken, I had assured Robert's victory. He could now transport I love that. troops I assured and it. weapons to yeah. invade the Iron Islands. Because they are known for their ships. After that, they're gone. Robert had plenty of both. I've never seen such allegiance as Robert could inspire in war. <laughs> Enemies who tried to kill him one day would be drinking with him the next under their own fallen <laughs> banners. We know someone like that. against the Iron Throne, Lord Balon did more than Robert ever could to cement his rule. When Robert came to the Iron Islands, he brought with him the full power of Westeros. Mm. Sir Barristan Selmy of the King's Guard led the assault on Old Wick, while I subdued strong. Great Wick, the largest of the Iron Islands. But Robert saved the seat of House Greyjoy, Pike, for himself and Lord Eddard. Robert would later boast of the battle's bloodiness and how he could have torn down the island into the waves if Lord Balon hadn't bent the knee. But if I'd of course he speaks assault, about Balon's neck would have bent under his sword. Damn. Because I do not forget. I do not pardon. His wow. time will come. <laughs> All their times will come. Oh Shit. damn! That was like a strong finish yeah. by Stannis. I do not forget. I like it. I Just do not difference. pardon. I respect him because he didn't agree with his brother's ruling, but he yeah. did obey it because yep. he had a respect for the chain of command. Well, honor. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's pretty cool. Stannis is he's a uh, he's a unique individual. <laughs> yeah, he's a good leader. Like he's got different good leaders like Ned, but. He's just very much about... He's got his set of values and he yeah. will not compromise on them for the most part. Yeah. Melisandre he's is a bit of a... Great, great area for there, him, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is House Tyrell from Marjorie Tyrell. Tyrell. Again, okay. Oh, on House Tyrell. On the uh, House Tyrell, okay. yeah. House Tyrell trace our descent to Garth Greenhand, the legendary first king of the Reach who made the land bloom. But so too does every noble house around us. It seems dear ancestor Garth planted as many flowers as he plucked. A king should have more consideration for his line, don't you think? For over a thousand years, the Greenhand sons and grandsons ruled the Reach as house gardener. The offshoots of his daughters grew into vast and powerful houses in their own right, except for House Tyrell. We chose instead to serve our gardener cousins faithfully as stewards to manage their stronghold of High Garden and the daily affairs of the Reach. Our words are growing strong. Mm. And under our stewardship, the Reach did just that. As did we. Until a blundering king we almost know cost us everything. Aegon Targaryen had landed in Westeros. King Myrne allied us with the Roth to repel the upstart's army. One can so only marvel that King to Myrne story. did not reconsider when he saw the living dragons against him. Perhaps he should have sought counsel from his trusted stewards before he set out. Then again... Damn. How shocking would that be? Three dragons just sweep in. At the Field of Fire, Aegon, and let us not forget, his sisters, burnt the combined armies of the Reach and Rock. King Myrne paid for his misjudgment with his life and that so of his brutal. ancient family. In a day, the Reach had lost its king, its ruling house, and most of its army. Thankfully for everyone, my ancestor, Harlan Tyrell, had better sense. Until the Maesters sorted out the intel among Myrne's cousins, Harlan the Steward was acting Lord of Highgarden. To ensure peace and life in the Reach, he would yield the castle to Aegon. The other castles and families would then follow, as they had since the Dawn Age. Aegon had a continent to conquer, and the fertile reach was too valuable to raise. He accepted Harlan's wow. proposal and welcomed our lands into his kingdom. To show his gratitude, Aegon entitled Harlan to Highgarden, the castle his family had served for a thousand years. She's rewriting a lot of what she said before. Tyrell, his wardens yeah. of the south, choosing us over older, greater families in the reach. Yeah, Our wow. House thus owed everything to the Targaryens. So is it any wonder we stayed true to King Ares, even during his madness, um. and even after Robert Baratheon rebelled? 
Some right. may question my father for laying siege to the Baratheon's home, instead of marching to aid Prince Rhaegar, before Robert could kill him and scatter the royal army. But let us not forget that we had already dealt Robert his only defeat of the war at Ashford. If Lord Tywin Lannister had not the only one. vanquished the Mad King so suddenly, our siege would have destroyed Robert's home and his brothers, and won the war for Ares. But when the Targaryens fell, House Tyrell again chose peace and prosperity over war and devastation, and yeah. bent the knee to King out of it all. Baratheon, yeah. first of his name. We returned to Highgarden to manage the affairs of the Reach, as we had for thousands of years, and will for a thousand more. Other great houses take lions and wolves for their sigils, and draw their power from the gold in their mountains, or the cold of their winters. Oh yeah, what is Tyrell's sigil? But mountains run dry, winter yields Bowers. to spring, and the rose blooms the rose. once more. The rose, she keeps mentioning the rose, okay. Yeah. If that is not, not the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes sense why her brother was the, is he a lord of flowers, remember? Yeah, true, true. Yeah. I wonder if, because they seem to be so loyal to the Targaryens, I wonder if Daenerys comes back, Ooh. if they will then pledge their allegiance to true. her. Potentially. I mean, they did say there's lots of people who are waiting for her return in Westeros. We just don't know who those people are and yeah. they really haven't mentioned it. But I, I find feel like it, these will be one of them. Yeah, potentially. But I do find it interesting that they really do bend the knee to whoever's in power and they don't really rebel much. Like, we've just seen it now when... I think a lot of it's just they're fighting for their king and when they know their king changes... There's no point to continue fighting. Yeah, but it's almost to preserve their house and, and their uh, name course, and their yeah, honor. Because, I mean, we saw as soon as Renly was killed, she goes off to Joffrey. And let's be fair, she probably doesn't really care about Joffrey, but it's that status, that power. And she always talks about the rise and Rose. That's also why people fight for their king. They fight for the side they think will win. Yeah. And because that's going to give them the most glory and power and status. Yeah, but not necessarily as well. Like, people have enough honour where... Yeah, you've got your neds. But in this time, they know what's right and wrong, or they just will follow their king blindly. Mm, yeah, I don't feel like that depicts Game of Thrones very well, though. I feel like Game of Thrones, at large, is that every family has their own agenda, responsibility, piece of glory they want. And a lot of those things that go into the mix when they are choosing who to fight for. Even Tywin, who was the hand for 25 years, once he real once he deemed the king unfit to be a king, and you know, the Lannisters have a status to represent only the best in his mind, he changed size, even though that was but considered a disloyal think, thing to do. Yeah, I still think it's still the minority, because we're just talking about like a few like higher up characters rather than like the whole well, We're talking about the houses that have been relevant. Yeah. But I just feel like with Marjorie, it's, it's always looking to gain more status, more power. I mean, she wants to be the queen. Like, that was her words. And I guess that little background information really solidified her motivations and why she's doing what she's doing for me. Maybe. I see it a bit differently, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, so back to House Greyjoy from Theon and Yara. Where the North has its honor and the South its chivalry, the Iron Islands has its strength. We call ourselves the or Iron Dawn, and we are warriors feared throughout the Seven Kingdoms. Or so we used to be. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike their mainland cousins, the first men of the Iron Islands never bowed to the old gods. Theirs was the Drowned God, who made the Ironborn to yeah, reach right. and sack that. and write their names in salt, steel, and song, that his enemy, the Storm God, could not wash away. We raised our kings from our own ranks and used beaten foes as thralls to work our mines and farm our land. Damn spell was salt completely was, brutal. If one was pretty enough. Such was the old way, and while we followed it, we held sway wherever the waves were heard. When Aegon came demanding fealty, King Harren the Black ruled as far east as the Trident. Other kings like the Starks could kneel, but Harren was ironborn. And the Ironborn must be beaten. In Harrenhal, he they had need to the earn mightiest it. castle yeah. in Westeros. 
they need Neil to, to defend it. someone that aimed stronger. But Aegon did not intend a siege. He mounted his dragon and roasted Harren and all his sons in their tower. And the old yeah, have that them. girth, yeah. Because of Harren's defiance, Aegon pushed the Ironborn back to our islands and gave the Riverlands to the Tullys. But he did allow the Ironborn to choose who would lead them. House Greyjoy had always been one of the That's greatest houses of lands. the Iron Islands. We trace our descent from the Age of Heroes and the legendary Grey King, who took a mermaid to wife and made war upon the Storm God for a thousand years. Blessed by the Drowned God, the Grey King fought and slew Naga, the great sea dragon, and took her fire for his own. This history made our ancestor, Vicon Greyjoy, the natural choice to lead the Ironborn after Aegon's conquest. For 300 years, House Greyjoy ruled the Ironborn. We styled ourselves Lord of the Iron Islands, a long time. King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, Lord Reaper of Pike. In truth, we were thralls. Our people still chanted, what is dead may never die. Yeah. But the old way had died. Until so the Targaryens followed their dragons into the grave. And our Lord Father, Balon Greyjoy, rose against the new king, Robert Baratheon. He seized so our ancient chance finally realm came. and sent our iron fleet against the Lannisters at Lannisport, burning all their ships before any could weigh anchor. So they destroyed the Lannisters. Robert and <laughs> Stark would later defeat him. They understood us no better than Aegon. The Greyjoy sigil is the Kraken. What it grasped once, it will never surrender. What is dead, dead may, may never die. die. Until Balon bent the knee. How are these true surrender? Yeah. I think that's the point that will keep coming back. Yeah. It was like a for now. So House Clegane, Sandor Clegane. So is that, is Sandor the mountain? I think so. Okay. We'll soon find out. But we haven't really heard much from them independently. So this one would be interesting. Yeah. I wonder if that house will become a bigger part of uh, season three. Potentially. Honor, glory, lies to make idiot boys want knighthood, and idiot <laughs> girls spread their legs for it. Let me oh tell my you God. what makes a knight. Killing. Either enough men, or the right man. House Clegane should know. We're very good at both. Is Most the hound? Most claim some Sounds great like ancestors the so yeah. far back that nobody can prove them liars. It is. Not us. My grandfather kept the kennel for Lord Titus Lannister of Casterly Rock, the father of Lord Tywin. Lord Titus was a weak man who didn't know it. One day while hunting, he stumbled on a lioness. Instead of Shit. embracing the man who wore her on his banners, she tried to tear out his throat. Damn. Lucky my grandfather came up with the dogs and drove the big cat away. As a reward, the Cleganes got lands and a keep and a son to squire for the Lannisters. We took the three yeah, hounds well. who died for them as our new sigil. When Tywin Lannister okay, became sense. Lord of Casterly Rock, he wanted more from his former kennel master than fealty. He bet that training hounds to kill isn't far from training boys to kill. In just two generations, my brother Gregor and I proved him right. I gutted my first man at 12. 12? Years after. Seven started disappearing in our keep, and even a sister I don't remember. Wow. But nobody could prove anything against Gregor, or dared if they caught him at it. So he was but just my killing everyone. Wanted a knight in our family, and thought he'd found one in Gregor, who at thirteen towered over Which is the mountain. Men, the and mountain. they called yeah. him the mountain. Sure, yeah. Gregor looks quite the champion from a distance. But a mountain can't cleave a man in half with one blow and won't break a wench's face if she talks. Through Lord Tywin's influence, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen kindly anointed my brother personally. A great honor for our family, everyone said. One year later, Sir Gregor chivalrously sacked the prince's city, brained the prince's baby, and raped and murdered the prince's wife, winning us oh yet yeah. more honor from the new king and queen wow soon after my father died they say in a hunting accident <laughs> they say the same day that gregor became lord of the clegane lands 
gold and anything under his roof, I left our home to take service at Castle Rock. Mm. Lord Tywin is not like his father. Neither is King Joffrey. Or the likes of me would never be on the King's Guard, with all those true knights. Between them, a man who serves the Lannisters will never lack for killing. I'll guard this king, such as he is. Gregor will kill the other ones, such as he does. When we're done, we'll see how many people still believe in songs and fairy tales. Yeah. Wow, that was that one I liked a lot. He was, yeah, wow. A lot more depth to a character that hasn't said all too much so far still. Yeah. Other than his last minute actions of leaving his role as Kingsguard. Mm. That's interesting. Especially I like how he's sort of almost talking about it like him and his brother are the product of his family constantly chasing this this goal. And they're sort of just say, just representing how futile it was, how they're just killing and serving. They don't even believe in what they're doing, but they're just doing it because they don't know what, what else to do with themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And I found it interesting that he was saying like the mountain probably killing their siblings and potentially the father. Yeah. But not only that, then he go, uh, which I didn't completely understand. He was saying that the mountain couldn't kill in one blow and then wasn't as brutal to women. I don't know. Did you? Do little, I don't remember everything. It's a lot for me to get. Oh, okay. Yeah, something I didn't he, really... I, I didn't catch any of that, though, that he was saying he wasn't brutal. Not that he wasn't brutal, that it w he goes, well, you know, you'd think that the mountain is strong or whatever, but he couldn't, like... He was saying literally a mountain does not do this. So he's sort of taken the title away from his brother, the way oh, I took okay. it. Oh, okay. was like a mountain wouldn't do this and a mountain wouldn't do that. Okay. Right. Maybe almost insinuating that a mountain would be more peaceful. I don't know. Yeah. And I liked how he mentioned... Or I found it interesting that he mentioned that, you know, the real knights. He didn't really mm. consider them real knights. Yeah, I found that interesting too. So he just sees himself as just, I don't know, a killer essentially. Like it, there's no honor and whatnot behind it. Like other knights kind of see it. But it was funny at the start, he's like, oh, it's all lies just to, you know, have women open their legs and men fight. And like die for glory or whatever. <laughs> yeah, which underpins a lot of his, you know, beliefs that we see he has around around himself. Yeah. So this is a little perspective from Igret, which is from the other side of the wall, up north. Um, and this is the Free Folk. A long time ago, they say, some old southern king enslaved our giants by magic and forced them to build your famous wall. Then he kicked all of my kind to the other side and raised an army to keep us there. And we're the uncivilized ones. Wildlings. <laughs> Interesting. Might be Sir King was wise. Even a giant can be made to kneel. But only if he wants a better crack at your head. The free folk don't giants. follow a man because his father tells us. If the king's son was brave and strong, aye, we'd follow him as we did his father. If he wasn't. But it seems to me, as much as the wall keeps us out, it keeps you southerners in. Mm. You follow laws you didn't make. True. You to kings you didn't choose and pray to God. Some good points. You never Some very hear good points. From. <laughs> Traders talk about your seven. Beyond the wall, the stars shine bright and clear. Any gods there aren't listening to the likes of men. Our gods are of the forest, in the trees that shelter us and the rivers that feed us. They gave the land for all of us to share. Yeah, so they, they hear from their gods. farm and hunt where we will, when we need. Yeah. If a man wants a woman, he has to prove he'll give her strong and cunning sons. That's easy. Right, as opposed to being when married she off and stuff. Slit his throat, he don't let her. <laughs> As a free folk, you get what you can take, and you keep what you can hold. Yeah. No more. I Not wonder, as greedy. Even if my kind didn't hop so over your wall, would he still set your night's watch to guard it? You southerners are rich. You always Ooh. have more steel, gold, and daughters. 
I think you're afraid. If you've always knelt, you don't know what freedom is. And if you've not been beyond the wall, you don't know what fear is. You Damn. Wow. That's a bloody wolf bear or some shit. Yeah, I know. That's interesting that she said that. I mean, there's different perspectives of freedom there. And we got a little bit of insight into that into from season two with her conversations with John. But it was interesting that she was saying, you know, we don't even try and breach the wall, but you guys, you know, all high and mighty have the Night's Watch there. Which is interesting. I don't, well, firstly, it's not just for the wildlings, to be fair. 100%. And we did see wildlings past yeah. the wall, though. So I it's don't just know. her perspective. Yeah. yeah. But it's just interesting that she has that kind of view of it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mind some of her, um, just the parallels and contrasts yeah. she was drawing. I thought that was cool just hearing their perspective, the way they view it from that side of the wall. Yeah. And she's like, you don't know what fear is until you've like seen what's on the other side of the wall. I like that. <laughs> Okay, so this is from Igra again about the Night's Watch. Swords in the darkness. Aye. The Black Brothers of the Night's Watch are that, at least. As too many of the free folk know. You Southerners are strange. <laughs> A man murders and you train him to kill better. A man mm. thieves or rapes and you send him where it's dark and private. True. Yeah. You make him promise to be good. Yeah. Yeah. Can regret even that. From the time he's woken to the time he's allowed to sleep, he walks the frozen wall, carries frozen stones, or boils frozen food. When he lies down at night, he can't have nobody to warm his frozen bed. Mm. Yeah, the kind of women the true. Crows like to nest together. I mean, he some of the higher ups the do, but they told him then about when the White Walkers woke in the land of always winter. And how the wall and the night's watch were raised to stop them the next time. Never mind trapping us on the other side. We free yeah. folk have our stories too. About how one of your king crows found something cold in the woods. With bright blue eyes. Ugh. Yeah. How he brought her home through your wall. And declared oh, that himself guy. night's king. Thirteen years he and his queen ruled over his brothers, making sacrifices as black as their cloaks. Looking right. for the Southerners, the free folk rallied to a king beyond the wall, as we will when need be, and marched on the ancient castle he'd taken for his own, the Night Fort. With the help oh, of the night stars, we, haven't seen that yet. we killed the demon and cleansed your precious watch. And then they thanked us and kicked us back across the wall. As you always have. Gendon, Interesting. Raymond Redbeard, the Horned Lord. We haven't heard much about that battle. Each as a king be on the wall, each promising victory. And all falling to the Night's Watch and the Starks. But this time is different. The Starks in particular. Our new king knows your tricks. You called him I really write this new once, king. But he never forgot his wings. We know how you think. Man's radar. I know where you're weak. Watch for us from your wall if you like. With the cold, you won't even feel the blade slip into your back. Damn. I know, she's a little uh, savage there. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that. I do hope that she doesn't betray John, though. I mean, she's doing good by him so far. I think it's Lisa John's worries. Yeah. He's yeah. He's literally in a camp. I don't know who, just wondering how he's going to get out of it. Yeah. Oh, he'll get his way out. I mean, they trust him at the moment, but that's for season three. But yeah, so we hadn't really heard much about all the different kings. And I felt like that guy that married or had children with or whatever it was with the girl with the blue eyes, was that the guy that was giving his daughter's babies Away. I thought so too. That's what I thought. I thought so. So maybe he has some sort of personal relations with the White Walkers. That's why they, because she looked yeah. like she was some sort of White Walker. Yeah. Like was the queen of them or something. Yeah. And that's what See. makes me think it was him. And then they've got their little deal to whatever. We don't know much yet. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Okay. So this is Dragonstone from Sanus Baratheon. 
Nobody knows why the Targaryens first came to the island of Dragonstone. Old Valyria was then at the height of its power and the center of the civilized world, which ended at the Narrow Sea. Westeros was a filthy backwater with seven kings squabbling over borders and minor glories. So much for progress. <laughs> the island itself was and is nothing. It had no gold or gems to lure Valyrian nobility. All it has is rock. Mostly a shiny black stone, too brittle for war and too sharp for building. The Targaryens called it dragon glass. I was about to say, that's I the one, yeah. useless. <laughs> but the Targaryens managed oh, to raise status. a castle here. Simpletons claim they used ancient Valyrian Simpletons. sorcery, forgetting that the Targaryens brought a small army with them from Essos. There's no magic in strong backs, though admittedly the castle is unlike any in Westeros. Foreign and strange. <laughs> if the Targaryens ever regretted their barren outpost and longed for the comforts of home, the doom made their folly permanent. Mm. Valyria collapsed into the waves and was no more. To look east was to see the ruin of their homeland, the greatest civilization before or since. But to look west, as Aegon realized, was to see a fertile land ripe for conquest. Perhaps even a new Valyria. Though good for little else, Dragonstone was the perfect staging point for Aegon's invasion of Westeros. The Blackwater Bay granted easy access to the continent. The lands there were disputed by three kingdoms. The Reach, the Iron Islands and the Stormlands. But their capitals were far enough away that none could mount a force before Aegon got a foothold. Even if their kings had been able to stop bickering over whose problem he was. Then it was too All of late. your problems. Aegon had chosen his first camp well. With the bay to the east, the river to the south, and open fields to the north and west, his army would be impossible to take by surprise. A perfect mm. site for an invasion, and one day, his capital city. King's Landing. The Doom had taught the Targaryens the prudence of refuge. Aegon was pretty After the conquest. On. Dragonstone became the seat of the crown prince and heir to the Iron Throne. It would serve them well, and me ill, 300 years later after my brother Robert Baratheon rebelled against the Iron Throne and the Lannisters slaughtered the mad King Aerys and his royal family. Robert dispatched me to deal with the last surviving Targaryen children, but before yeah. I arrived, a loyal knight smuggled them across the narrow sea to safety. Hatred for the Targaryens blinded Robert. Unjustly, it did I was blind blamed him. and stripped of our family's castle of Storm's End so he's really and given Dragonstone that. in its stead. Over the years, whenever I demanded my rights restored, Robert would remind me of the island's royal pedigree and pretend he was doing me Of course honor, he did. As if I were one of his tavern girls to be so easily deceived and dismissed. <laughs> so he's pretty bitter towards Robert. Robert is dead. And I, Stannis Baratheon, am the, the rightful king, king of Westeros. Yeah. Let the usurpers and traitors sit on the Iron Throne. From Dragonstone, I will be the dagger at their throat. Ooh. I like that a lot. I always love hearing from Sanus, but it was interesting. He's like, you know, as if I would be deceived, like, who do you think I am? Yet Robert was deceived his whole life, or maybe he just turned a blind eye to it, but I feel like he was deceived about, you know, the bastard children, not his, more so Cersei's. Yeah, 100%. It's definitely interesting hearing Stannis' perspective that he's very hell-bent on the fact that he was... His brother sort of didn't treat him well, and, yeah. and I'm almost starting to believe him more that he probably was overlooked a little bit, and you know, not given the respect or glory that he deserved. And in spite of all that, because he respected there was an order to things, yeah. he endured his situation, even though he didn't agree or like it. And I respect him a lot for that too, because that also shows strength of character that he respected his older brother enough for what he had done. Not only did he back him in the war and not get the honor that he sort of deserved, yeah. he still stayed loyal. I feel like I feel like Stannis is owed. If he doesn't get like the 
thrown at any point in this show. Oh man, that poor man is like, he's earned the, uh, at least a seal on it. Yeah. And I guess that's why he's fighting so hard now too. Like in every right, he has been, owed, like he is owed so much more than what he's gotten. And I think this is like the last final thing as well. Yep. for him so like I, and that's where it gets dangerous like you start crossing those gray areas of you know lacking a little bit of honor and going into black magic with melisandre and stuff <laughs> okay so this is harren hall with catelyn stark which we've kind of left in season two littlefinger now has harren hall so all right let's go on the shores of the god's eye due north of the isle of faces rises a monument to arrogance and cruelty. <laughs> Harrenhal. For a people who prided themselves on their ships, the Iron Men of old seized any chance to leave them and carved out a vast <laughs> kingdom from the peaceful river lords. The empire reached its zenith under King Heron Hora, called the Black by those he terrorized and by his own men, though they meant it proudly. King Heron enslaved the Riverlands to raise the mightiest fortress Westeros had ever seen. A castle that could garrison a million men, with walls so vast that winters would come and go, and besieging armies grow old and grey before the castle fell. Five towers he ordered, reaching into the heavens like grasping fingers. A monstrosity which he forced our people to build for their own subjugation. But the very day the slaves laid the last stone, Aegon Targaryen and his sisters arrived in the south. When they oh, arrived with their small dude. army, you'd be spewing. Laughed what timing? And shut the gates. Heron Hall would have its first test, and an easy one at that. Yeah, damn. It failed. Heron Hall could out, have withstood dude. an assault from all the armies in Westeros combined. Stop but Heron dragons. learned that the tallest and thickest walls meant little to dragons. Wow, oh, how unlucky he'd be spewing. One With day Heron after. And his dead, Heron Hall quickly surrendered to Aegon. Yeah. House Tully then raised the River no Lords choice. in rebellion against the Iron Islands. And with Aegon, we flushed the Iron Men to the sea. We should have torn down the castle stone by stone then. But Heron Hall seemed such a magnificent prize that Aegon gave it to one of his commanders whose line then withered to extinction. Oh, wow. As would every family to hold it thereafter. Oh, shit, it's a curse. When many speak of Harrenhal, their voices drop to whispers about to Mad Lady Lothson, who was said to send a giant bat to collect children for her crockpots and to bathe in blood and serve feasts of human flesh. About oh the God. ghosts of Black Heron and his sons who still walk the castle at night, all aflame. Of the servants who went to bed in full health and were found in the morning, burnt to ash. Mere Damn. stories to frighten wayward children Damn. and excite young girls, you may say. You would not be entirely wrong. Heron Hall is a prize. A nigh impregnable castle with enough land and enough income to make a man at a stroke. One of the greatest lords in Westeros. Okay. But you would not be entirely right either. Say by a king's grace, Harrenhal became yours. Now you must garrison it. You must repair it and maintain it. Mm. Even stretched to the ends of your means, you cannot fill and manage the whole castle. So you retreat your household to four of the five towers, then three, then two. Then only the bottom thirds of those. You close the hall of a hundred hearths and take your meals in your rooms. Even then you can't shake the feeling of desolation, that Heron Hall and its vastness is devouring you. In later years, as you bury a grandson or a great-grandson, the last of your line, you will know it has. Dying. She put that gently. Yeah, I know. Well, that's interesting. She said everyone, which I guess might be a little bit of a spoiler, but any person who has Harren Hall or any family that has Harren Hall, their line ends with them. So I don't think it's a spoiler because I'm assuming that the show doesn't explain it. 
Yeah, but Littlefinger now having it, I guess he is the end of his line anyways for now. Potentially, yeah. Um, to be fair, he has no, yeah, he has no offsprings anyway. Yeah. And then also Harwin. Harwin's dead, we but what's that. his family's name again? Strong. Strong. So. Does that mean Laris will be the end of his people too? He's lying too then. I hope so. Well, he is the last son and he's a cripple, so. And he cut off his brother and his uh, father, so yep. potentially, yeah. So now we've got the Free Cities by Jorah, which will be a bit of a different take. Yeah. We haven't really heard too much about the Free Cities. And even just Jorah, we don't really know a lot about his life, his backstory. So it will be cool to hear his perspective on that. At its height, the Valyrian Freehold ruled over half the known world. Not bad for former shepherds, but the doom fell on them and sank it's very historically into like, the sea. Up. Now Volantis is the ember of old Valyria, ensuring its flame from? does not go out from this world, right. as any Volantine will tell you. Pentoshi say the same about Pentos, Lysines about Lys, and so on. But after enough time in the nine free cities, it's hard to see them as anything but ashes of glory. Volantis is the oldest, the first colony of Valyria. After the doom, the Volantines tried to rebuild the Empire under their rule. They failed. Not least because the last Valyrian with dragons, Aegon Targaryen, entered the war against them. Now they are content to dominate only their lower classes. Those dragons, so man, that changed everything. Bravos is the strangest. They're probably about to a again. city erected not by the Freehold, but against True. it. A labyrinth of illusion and deceit to hide the refugees from Valyria's slave lords. After the doom, the city emerged from the shadows to become one of the greatest banking centers in the world. Okay. A man can get anything in Bravos for a price, especially death. Your own if you offend one of the swaggering swordsmen that pollute the city. Or oh if you're very rich or very desperate, anyone else's. Where Syria and Jack and are from. This is the easiest of the free cities, full of pleasure houses catering to every taste. No matter how <laughs> peculiar. Many men lose themselves in lease and are never found, at least alive. <laughs> when a man Damn. runs out of coin, the Lysines may grant him their other speciality on the house. Poison. Damn. Ah, Pentos That's is ruthless. the most ruthless. It's like Magisters when everyone goes to die. Show of choosing the Prince of Pentos from the great families and granting him the powers of trade, justice and war. As long as he checks with them first. On the new year, to bring good fortune to Pentos, this prince must deflower the maid of the field and the maid of the seas. I confess I don't know how each is chosen, or what becomes of them after serving their purpose. But if a crop should wow. fail or a war be lost, the Magisters will slit the prince's throat and choose another. Oh my the god! The other three are known for what they make. Mia has its lenses and finery, Norvos its axes, Quoho, it's smiths who can reforge Valyrian steel. Tyrosh, it's colors. I'm sure Lorath had something to the world, but I can't think of it. <laughs> Frankly, the nine of them are more alike than they would care to admit. They hire the same soldiers to fight the same wars for the same rulers, the rich. Be they called magisters, archons, or what have you. When a Dothraki Kalasar approaches, they gift the same tribute to avoid the same sacking. Yeah. For thousands of years, the disgraced of Westeros have drained east to pool in the free cities, where a man of honor counts for less than nothing, unless it raises his price. Better Damn. men than I have learned that what a man sells- Stannis will not survive there. He can never buy it back. He must earn it by fire and blood. Here's the name fire of the book, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, damn, fire and blood. Yeah, you're right. Sanus would definitely not survive there. And Ned would be screwed too. Yeah. Although Ned's screwed pretty much everywhere he goes. Yeah, true. <laughs> too, he's, too, he's too nice for the times he lives in. Although he did have some success, but I digress. Half uh, from Zaro Zoan Daxos. Is that how you say his name, guys? Zaro is good enough for me. Let's hear from his perspective. Yeah. Carth has always and only belonged to the Carthine. We were never part of Valeria's empire. 
nor have we ever fallen to a Dothraki horde. Our walls mm. and the red waste outside them guard us from such annoyance. Until Danny. Many call the approach to our city the Garden of Bones. It needs mm. little tending to grow. Our city, however, would be quite a prize for any empire. Karth straddles two worlds, a greedy and curious west and a rich and mysterious east. The marvels of Yiti and Ashai pass through our markets and share births with the riches of the free cities and Westeros. Our ports have it's fulfilled that middle many land. traders' dreams, almost as many as they have broken. We call Karth the greatest city that ever was or will be. An easy claim to make if one knows only the docks and customs houses of other cities. An easy lie to swallow if a people see only the gold and jewels of their rulers, which we, sure. the 13 who govern the city, are careful to ensure. Damn, wonder what happens now that they're all dead. They shook off the yoke of unjust kings long ago, so they Danny are told rules. festivals by the pureborn. The king's direct descendants who have controlled the Thirteen ever since. Only now, instead of scepters, they use ships. A merchant only remains on the Thirteen until the others are no longer afraid to deny him, or too afraid to deny his replacement. Okay. okay. Except for the warlocks. They alone hold a hereditary seat. A relic from when they had powers, or at least from when the world was younger and more easily duped. Over the years, we have developed an understanding with them. They shall always be welcome on our councils and at affairs of state, Ugh. provided they never come. Rare is the civic problem that can be solved by cryptic nonsense and shade of the evening. Thankfully, they need little encouragement to confine themselves to their house of the undying. Which we Yet perhaps we with. Carthine are too confined ourselves. We feel safe behind our walls and our laws, which no visitor can hope to follow, and by which any citizen who vouches for a guest always pays with his life. Yeah, but damn. like a ship in the summer damn. seas, like Zara the city did. grows becalmed without fresh wind. The greatest city that ever was or will be? An epitaph. I would prefer... The greatest Ugh. city that is. Well, not anymore, my love. Not anymore. When you think about it, he works so hard to get to where he is, all just to lose it to somebody who he vows to let in. Like, yep. in the end, he was better on the 13. Danny now has locked him in some sort of vault where he's going to just rot away. Which is I know. Pretty brutal. Still screws my, with my head a little bit. Well, that's what happens when you don't have any faith in, like, the old powers, I guess, of dragons and things like that. But you mentioned what would kind of be left of Karth. I mean, I don't know specifically Karth, but now there is an opening for all the ports that they managed and stuff to be claim so i wonder who's going to do that the west or the east like esos and stuff or westeros then it can become the queen of karth really if she wants yeah, she wants more than that she wants as a starting throne. point as a starting point yeah. she needs an army to take any throne well she's already preparing to leave just gather what she can and set off yeah the drowned god by yara Greyjoy, which we know is, is their god the one they serve yeah the the, they, the one that they believe in the one that floods the lands i was saying yeah the god of the sea or whatever the seven are gods of weakness and defeat. Straight Pretty into it. chains that the first men kindly put on after the Andals crushed them. Except in the Iron Islands. Since the Dawn Age, the Ironborn have followed the drowned god, who plucked fire from the sea and made us to reeve and sack and carve our names in blood and song. When the Andals landed on the Iron Islands, they found a god who was father, warrior, and stranger who took mother, maiden, and crone when he would, and held the smith in thrall. His priests are the drowned men, who are clothed and armed by the sea itself. They consecrate us to the drowned god through our most sacred rite, the drowning, and ask the god to raise us from the sea as he was, harder and stronger. The ironborn do not fear the bloodiest battles or the roughest waves. For the drowned god taught us long ago that what is dead may never die. When an ironborn falls, even though it has, we say the drowned god needed a strong oarsman and took him below to feast in the god's watery halls. 
attended by mermaids. But even in death, an ironborn is a warrior. We fight against the storm god, who holds a castle in the clouds, and sends the winds to lure the ironborn off course or wreck our ships. It's said my legendary ancestor, the Grey King, waged war upon the storm god for a thousand years. Grey King, we heard about that a couple times With now. With the drowned god's help. He slew the great sea dragon Naga and used her bones for his hall. After his death, the storm god tried to wash away any memory of this terrible foe, but his songs fill our halls to this day. It was the storm god who first blew the Andals to the Iron Islands to subdue us and turn us from our faith. True, they conquered and killed our king, but in time they forsook their septs for the shore and their fat septons for the drowned men. The Andals came to us as conquerors. In the end, they drowned. Damn. The Ironborn are of the sea, as our god wow. made us, and given to it as our god taught us. They're very us. proud people, you can tell. We do not fear the storm god's winds or his waves, but you should, for they bring <laughs> us to you. <laughs> oh, damn, Yara. <laughs> No mercy on Yara. I know, but you can see that their whole history is about, you know, the drowned god and their faith in that. So when, and I guess Theon hasn't been well educated in that. He only knows what he learned from a young boy. So when he thought, you know, taking the north, Winterfell would do him like a great honor, you yeah, can see it why it really didn't. Wanted. Yeah, you can see exactly why it didn't. Like it's got nothing to do with their. Like the way they do things and what they believe in, so. And also where they feel they're their strongest, which is on the seas. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay, so this is the Alchemist Guild. So Helen Payne. Oh, no. Helene and the Pyromancer. Who's Helene? I don't know, but it's not Helen Payne. <laughs> no. <laughs> I I saw, like, the L-L-Y-N-E, -L -L -E, and I was meant to be Ilan Payne or something like that. <laughs> I don't know who Helene is, to be honest. I don't remember... Unless, is she that girl that wore that mask? The one that talks to Jorah? Um, I don't potentially, know. but I don't know why she would be part of the Pyromancer, so... Let's find out. Dragons conquered the Seven Kingdoms, but to rule them, the Targaryens needed a less uh, temperamental tool. When the great king Maegon oh, saw the he's the old man with the, the, yeah. made the wildfire. He blessed it was a us chick. with his patronage. In those days, we commonly transmuted metals and other wonders, but the king was most interested in our mastery of the substance, which those not of our order dubbed wildfire. A slight misnomer. To the uninitiated, the substance indeed seems uncontrollable. Water will not extinguish it, nor plate of steel Damn. repel it. So is it controllable? Our oh, order alone knows its secrets. In bare stone cells beneath the guild hall, our acolytes prepare the substance with utmost care and ancient magic. Apprentices then remove the jars to a secure storage. Overseeing its purity are the wisdoms such as myself, who are adept in the alchemical mysteries. Should an acolyte prove unworthy and allow the substance to ignite, the ceilings are spelled to collapse and fill the room with sand. For once Oof. lit, only smothering or starvation will quench the fire. Shit. Damn. Many years did the alchemists we saw that serve battle. the Targaryens yeah. faithfully until we were beset on all sides by the envious, the Order of Maesters, who dismissed all learning but their own, and oh. <laughs> the charlatans who hucked green paint and worse in our names. After the unfortunate Prince Arian Tregarian, drunk with wine, boasted that a draught of the substance would transmute him into a dragon, we lost our Shit. royal favor. Then came the wise King Ares, second of his name. The wise. <laughs> I was merely an acolyte when he restored our guild to its former glory. As had his great forefathers, he appreciated our secret arts, even naming Wisdom Rossart as Hand of the King. 
Together, they punished his enemies as yeah. befits a true Targaryen. That's Ned's brother, I reckon. During the war Damn. of the usurper, yeah, it is I heard whispers that King Aerys had engaged our greatest wisdoms for an ultimate weapon against his foe. And what do you but think about sadly, that? sadly, King's Landing must have fallen before it could be used, and many of our wisdoms disappeared in the sack of the city. Victims of ignorance and envy, <laughs> as ever. That's funny. I'd wager. Yet our order perseveres, like the substance which grows ever more potent as it ages. We perfect Damn. our ancient arts in darkness, forgotten by the world. Allowed by Cersei. Masters of the fire, but we live only to serve. All we need is the right um, spark. Hmm. So see their spark? So his name is Helene or something like that. I'm assuming then. Yeah. I can't yeah. remember what his name was, but yeah. Yeah. He's got a very funny way of telling a story. Yeah, like I know. The wording, the description, the emotion behind his voice. It was, it was humorous. But it's just interesting. Like, obviously everyone's going to have different perspectives, but he was just saying like... Very much for the... Targaryen kings that yeah because you know, it's very that. much for his well they craft. need to serve they're not about they don't care about leading but they want to be used and they and they feel useful they're satisfied yeah and he's spiteful toward the maces that's so funny yeah he's calling <laughs> the ignorance I would have thought that he would have been part of that to be fair but obviously not pretty brutal just seeing that scene again with the collar around mm. Ned's brother I just the deeper we get into this world the more I really sympathise with holy shit how ruthless that would have been and just what a tragedy that would have been to the, the story imagine if we saw that in the actual season oh, like dude. rather than than these pictures yeah it would have been br brutal yeah for sure and last one for today we've got uh the warlocks by zaro again this is a short one that's left so we'll learn a little bit more about the warlocks which all well, these ones we dealt with in Karth, no longer exist yeah he's dead hey go on the East is plagued with mystics who claim many dread powers but prove only one, separating the foolish from their purses. Not so with the renowned warlocks of Karth. They demand a much dearer coin in return for their parlor tricks. Respect. Once, the warlocks truly were mighty, or so they would have us believe. Yeah, true. I do not doubt they have many secrets, they are an old order, and one does not obtain a seat on the Thirteen, the governing council of Karth, without making twelve of our most powerful citizens afraid to forbid it. <laughs> Thankfully yeah, for Karth, the Warlocks exert little influence in our politics. They rarely leave the confines of the House of the Undying, a pompous name, but, I admit, a strange and dark tower. It is said that none who enter ever leave. Of course, since Sounds there are no Danny. visible doors, I have to believe none ever enter either. <laughs> we can only imagine what the warlocks do inside. I wager we do not have to imagine much. They read dusty scrolls detailing their lost glory. They sip shade of the evening, a foul concoction brewed from the yeah. nearby trees until their lips turn blue, the better to frighten oh, children is that why they're blue? and the ignorant. Maybe. Stewing in their fantasies like an an old soldier who he really doesn't think much so of them, does no he? one may challenge their prowess. Whatever the warlocks may one. wish, their magic, like all magic, is dead in the world, if it ever existed. Though, one does hear strange whispers of late. Glass candles that have been cold for a hundred years, now burning. Ghost grass because of the dragons. found far from the lands of the shadow. A Kalasar led by a woman with three heads. Traders' oh. nonsense, most likely. But should the warlock's vaunted magic ever return, that would be a dangerous day for Karth. Which it did, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Eyes on them. Indeed. Yeah, so he kept his enemies closer, essentially, Zaro, like, when he made a deal with that warlock. Yeah, so by keeping his eye on them is how he noticed, obviously, that they obviously got more power once Danny had got no dragons, and yeah. they probably weren't anything special before then. Yeah, true. I still find Zaro just, like, intriguing. Like, his whole 
like persona was almost a lie just oh, i've got so many riches no one can open it you can have it if you find a way blah 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 stories and mystery yeah and now he's gone it's like damn he's already gone it feels like almost too soon but there's much better characters that have also met that fate yeah true it was actually nice hearing from different people than we did the first um histories and law video we really get to hear new perspectives and also different stories like the Tyrells and the High Garden story was very different. We hadn't heard that before. Even Clegane and the Pyromancer and things like that. But it was also good to hear from Rob, uh, Rob Stark. He was one of my favorite voices, I think. And just the way he told stories. But I bet you love Stannis. Yeah, I think I got the most out of Stannis' just personality and just hearing his perspective because he's yeah. been a bit of a mystery kind of figure that's very you know strong and prominent but his views are often you know very much his own and mm. keeps him to himself so getting to hear his interpretations around a lot of the events that we've come to know you know in the history surrounding westeros was interesting to hear from stannis's perspective yeah for me for sure you know what was funny in the season one histories and law we actually really loved the way robert would tell stories and in this one we actually like the way stannis does yeah yeah true actually because he had a, he had a, he was different he was more like almost like you'd imagine him you know drinking a beer at a, at a tavern and just yeah. and just belching out his stories and it was like seven hells <laughs> yeah 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 very expressive which is good stannis is just very direct in the way he speaks which i, which I also like yeah, what was Stannis's one line in this? I'll destroy you. That's the line that I love. Yeah, but, but he, he said something today. else. He said something else in this that was just like the more, you know. I feel like the illustrations in this were more enjoyable. They were more better, alive. Yeah. yeah, more alive. A little bit more to it in the detail, and I think it was also easier for us to follow because, I mean, we just know the world's a little bit better now. 100%. The more I know the world and the characters, they're a lot more information. Because it is a lot of information. I still find these a little bit longer than my attention span can handle. <laughs> but being more familiar with the world helps me retain you know, yeah. more information. So this one was based on the House of Westeros. Um, that's what it's titled. So houses, I, yeah. Yeah, Houses. So I wonder what like the next one will be. I guess it always follows the story that we've just finished for each season. But damn, I can't wait for season three. Yeah, and that's what I'm really looking forward to, to be honest. I'm looking forward to season three, episode one, to just see where the world's at and where all the characters are at. And yeah. I do think the next one will probably potentially cover maybe Pentos and some other places a bit more. Um, it was nice worlds. to hear about the free cities, actually. Like, just a little bit about them and what they're known for. Some yeah. of them are just not much. And a bit about the life of, like, beyond the wall in the, in the where the wildings are as well yeah that was actually nice because the other one was really heavily based on westeros and that like you know the targaryens and then the rebellion and stuff like that yeah so yeah the this one was actually i feel like more intriguing than the last and yeah for sure yeah hopefully just follows that trend so yeah, I am super excited for season three. Guys, we hope you enjoyed our reaction to season two, Histories and Law. Something a bit different that we've been doing with this. If you did enjoy it, leave a like, let us know in the comments down below. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button as we venture onto season three, which we've heard is going to be a big one and a wild one. So I think this is one you're not going to want to miss. I know. And like Spartan said, leave those comments down below. Give the video a like so we actually know that you enjoy this content still. Um, and whether it's worth potentially doing more of these because these are quite long to record. So we want to make sure that you guys are enjoying them. Take care of yourselves, guys, and we'll see you next time. See you guys.